Good evening, and welcome back to Booked for the Night. I'm Melissa Phillips, and tonight I'm reading chapters 4 through 6 of East of Eden by John Steinbeck. Enjoy. Chapter 4 Charles stood at the bar at the village inn, and Charles was laughing delightedly at the funny stories the night stranded drummers were telling. He got out his tobacco sack with its meager jingle of silver and bought the men a drink to keep them talking. He stood and grinned and rubbed his split knuckles. And when the drummers, accepting his drink, raised their glasses and said, Here's to you, Charles was delighted. He ordered another drink for his new friends, and then he joined them for some kind of deviltry in another place. When Cyrus stumped out into the night, he was filled with a kind of despairing anger at Charles. He looked on the road for his son, and he went to the inn to look for him, but Charles was gone. It is probable that if he had found him that night, he would have killed him, or tried to. The direction of a big act will warp history, but probably all acts do the same in their degree, down to a stone stepped over in the path, or a breath caught at a sight of a pretty girl, or a fingernail nicked in the garden soil. Naturally, it was not long before Charles was told that his father was looking for him with a shotgun. He hid out for two weeks, and when he finally did return, murder had sunk back to simple anger, and he paid his penalty in overwork and a false theatrical humility. Adam lay four days in bed, so stiff and aching that he could not move without a groan. On the third day, his father gave evidence of his power with the military. He did it as a poultice to his own pride and also as a kind of prize for Adam. Into the house, into Adam's bedroom, came a captain of cavalry and two sergeants in dress uniform of blue. In the dooryard, their horses were held by two privates. Lying in his bed, Adam was enlisted in the army as a private in the cavalry. He signed the articles of war and took the oath while his father and Alice looked on, and his father's eyes glistened with tears. After the soldiers had gone, his father sat with him a long time. I've put you in the cavalry for a reason, he said. Barrack life is not a good life for long, but the cavalry has work to do. I made sure of that. You're not let... You'll like going for the Indian country. There's action coming. I can't tell you how I know. There's fighting on the way. Yes, sir, Adam said. It has always seemed strange to me that it is usually men like Adam who have to do the soldiering. He did not like fighting to start with, and far from learning to love it, as some men do, he felt an increasing revulsion for violence. Several times his officers looked closely at him for malingering, but no charge was brought. During these five years of soldiering, Adam did more detail work than any man in the squadron, but if he killed any enemy, it was an accident of ricochet. Being a marksman and a sharpshooter, he was peculiarly fitted to miss. By this time, the Indian fighting had become like dangerous cattle drives. The tribes were forced into revolt, driven and decimated, and the sad, sullen remnants settled on starvation lands. It was not nice work, but given the pattern of the country's development, it had to be done. To Adam, who was an instrument, who saw not the future farms but only the torn bellies of fine humans, it was revolting and useless. When he fired his carbine to miss, he was committing treason against his unit, and he didn't care. The emotion of nonviolence was building in him until it became a prejudice like any other thought saltifying prejudice. To inflict any hurt on anything for any purpose became inimical to him. He became obsessed with his emotion, for such it surely was, until it blotted out any possible thinking in its area. But never was there any hint of cowardice in Adam's army record. Indeed, he was commended three times and then decorated for bravery. As he revolted more and more from violence, his impulse took the opposite direction. He ventured his life a number of times to bring in wounded men. He volunteered for work in field hospitals, even when he was exhausted from his regular duties. He was regarded by his comrades with contemptuous affection and the unspoken fear men have of impulses they do not understand. Charles wrote to his brother regularly, of the farm and the village, of sick cows and of a foaling mare, of the added pasture and the lightning-struck barn of Alice's choking death from her consumption, and his father's move to a permanent paid position in the GAR in Washington. As with many people, Charles, who could not talk, wrote with fullness. He set down his loneliness and his perplexities, 
and he put on paper many things he did not know about himself. During the time Adam was away, he knew his brother better than ever before or afterward. In the exchange of letters, there grew a closeness neither of them could have imagined. Adam kept one letter from his brother, not because he understood it completely, but because it seemed to have a covered meaning he could not get at. Dear Brother Adam, the letter said, I take my pen in hand to hope you are in good health. He always started this way to ease himself gently into the task of writing. I have not had your answer to my last letter, but I presume you have other things to do. Ha! Huh. The rain came wrong and damned, but the apple blossoms. There won't be many to eat next winter, but I will save what I can. Tonight I clean the house, and it is wet and soapy and maybe not any cleaner. How do you suppose Mother kept it the way she did? It does not look the same. Something settles down on it. I don't know what, but it will not scrub off. But I have spread the dirt around more evenly anyways. Ha ha. Did Father write you anything about his trip? He's gone clean out to San Francisco and California for an encampment of the Grand Army. The Secretary of War is going to be there, and Father is to introduce him. But this is not any great shucks to Father. He has met the President three, four times, and even been to supper to the White House. I would like to see the White House. Maybe you and me can go together when you come home. Father could put us up for a few days, and he would be wanting to see you anyways. I think I better look around for a wife. This is a good farm, and even if I'm no bargain, there's girls could do worse than this farm. What do you think? You did not say if you're going to come live home when you get out of the army. I hope so. I miss you. The writing stopped there. There was a scratch on the page and a splash of ink, and then it went on in pencil, but the writing was different. In pencil it said, Later. Well, right there the pen gave out. One of the points broke off. I'll have to buy another pen point in the village, rusted right through. The words began to flow more smoothly. I guess I should wait for a new pen point and not write with pencil. Only I was sitting here in the kitchen with a lamp on, and I guess I got to thinking, and it come on late. After twelve, I guess, but I never looked. Old Black Joe started crowing out in the hen house. Then Mother's rocking chair cricked for all the world like she was sitting in it. You know I don't take truck with that, but it set me mining backwards. You know how you do sometimes. I guess I'll tear this letter up, maybe, because what's the good of writing stuff like this? The words began to race now as though they couldn't get out fast enough. If I'm to throw it away, I'd just as well set it down, the letter said. It's like the whole house was alive and had eyes everywhere and like there were people behind the door just ready to come in if you looked away. It kind of makes my skin crawl. I want to say, I want to say, I mean, I never understood, well, why our father did it. I mean, why didn't he like the knife I bought him on his birthday? Why didn't he? It was a good knife and he needed a good knife. If he had used it or even honed it or took it out of his pocket and looked at it, that's all he had to do. If he liked it, I wouldn't have took out after you. I had to take out after you. Seems like to me my mother's chair is rocking a little. It's just the light. I don't take any truck with that. Seems like to me there's something not finished. Seems like when you half finish a job and can't think what it was. Something didn't get done. I shouldn't be here. I ought to be wandering around the world instead of sitting here on a good farm looking for a wife. There's something wrong, like it didn't get finished, like it happened too soon and left something out. It's me should be where you are and you here. I never thought like this before. Maybe because it's late. It's later than that. I just looked out and it's first dawn. I don't think I fell off to sleep. How could the night go so fast? I can't go to bed now. I couldn't sleep anyways. The letter was not signed. Maybe Charles forgot he had intended to destroy it and send it along. But Adam saved it for a time, and whenever he read it again, it gave him a chill, and he didn't know why. Chapter 5 On the ranch, the little Hamiltons began to grow up, and every year there was a new one. George was a tall, handsome boy, gentle and sweet, who had from the first a kind of courtliness. Even as a little boy, he was polite and what they used to call no trouble. From his father, he inherited the neatness of clothing and body and hair, and he never seemed ill-dressed even when he was. George was a sinless boy and grew to be a sinless man. No crime of commission was ever attributed to him, and his crimes of omission were only misdemeanors. In his middle life, at about the time such things were known about it, it was discovered that he had a pernicious anemia. It is possible that his virtue lived on a lack of energy. 
Behind George, Will grew along, dumpy and stolid. Will had little imagination, but he had great energy. From childhood on, he was a hard worker. If anyone would tell him what to work at and once told, he was indefatigable. He was a conservative, not only in politics, but in everything. Ideas he found revolutionary, and he avoided them with suspicion and distaste. Will liked to live, on, live so that no one could find faults with him, and to do that, he had to live as nearly like other people as possible. Maybe his father had something to do with Will's distaste for either change or variation. When Will was a growing boy, his father had not been long enough in the Salinas Valley to be thought of as an old-timer. He was, in fact, a foreigner and an Irishman. At that time, the Irish were much disliked in America. They were looked upon with contempt, particularly on the East Coast, but a little of it must have seeped out to the West. And Samuel had not only variability, but a man of ideas and innovations. In small cut-off communities, such a man is always regarded with suspicion until he has proved he is no danger to the others. A shining man like Samuel could, and can, cause a lot of wonder. He might, for example, prove too attractive to the wives of men who knew they were dull. Then there was his education and his reading, the books he bought and borrowed, his knowledge of things that could not be eaten or worn or cohabitated with, his interest in poetry and his respect for good writing. If Samuel had been a rich man like the Thorns or the Delmars, with their big houses and wide flat lands, he would have had a great library. The Delmars had a library, nothing but books in it and paneled in oak. Samuel, by borrowing, had read many more of the Delmars books than the Delmars had. In that day, an educated rich man was acceptable. He might send his sons to college without comment, might wear a vest and white shirt and tie in the daytime of a weekday, might wear gloves and keep his nails clean. And since the lives and practices of rich men were mysterious, who knows what they could use or not use? But a poor man, what need had he for poetry or for painting or for music not fit for singing or dancing? Such things did not help him bring in a crop or keep a scrap of cloth on his children's backs. And if in spite of this he persisted, maybe he had reasons which would not stand the light of scrutiny. Take Samuel, for instance. He made drawings of work he intended to do with iron or wood. That was good and understandable, even enviable. But on the edges of the plans he made other drawings, sometimes trees, sometimes faces or animals or bugs, sometimes just figures that you couldn't make out at all. And these caused men to laugh with embarrassed uneasiness. Then, too, you never knew in advance what Samuel would say or think or do. It might be anything. The first few years after Samuel came to Salinas Valley, there was a vague distrust of him. And perhaps Will, as a little boy, heard talk in the San Lucas store. Little boys don't want their fathers to be different from other men. Will might have picked up this kind of conservatism right then. Later, as the other children came along and grew, Samuel belonged to the valley, and it was proud of him in the way a man who owns a peacock is proud. They weren't afraid of him anymore, for he did not seduce their wives or lure them out of sweet mediocrity. The Salinas Valley grew fond of Samuel, but by that time, Will was formed. Certain individuals, not by any means always deserving, are truly beloved by, of the gods. Things come to them without their effort or planning. Will Hamilton was one of these, and the gifts he received were the ones he could appreciate. As a growing boy, Will was lucky. Just as his father could not make money, Will could not help making it. When Will Hamilton raised chickens and his hens began to lay, the price of eggs went up. As a young man, when two of his friends who ran a little store came to the point of despondent bankruptcy, Will was asked to lend them a little money to tide them over the quarter's bills, and they gave him a one-third interest for a pittance. He was not niggardly. He gave them what they asked for. The store was on his feet within one year, expanding in two, opening branches in three, and its descendants, a great mercantile system, now dominate a large part of the area. Will also took over a bicycle and tool shop for a bad debt. Then a few rich people of the valley bought automobiles, and his mechanic worked on them. Pressure was put on him by a determined poet whose dreams were brass, cast iron, and rubber. This man's name was Henry Ford, and his plans were ridiculous, if not illegal. Will grumblingly accepted the southern half of the valley as his exclusive area, and within 15 years the valley was too deep in Fords, and Will was a rich man driving a Marmon. Tom, the third son, was most like his father. He was born in fury and he lived in lightning. 
Tom came headlong into life. He was a giant in joy and enthusiasms. He didn't discover the world and its people. He created them. When he read his father's books, he was the first. He lived in a world shining and fresh and uninspected as Eden on the sixth day. His mind plunged like a colt in happy pasture, and when later the world put up fences, he plunged against the wire, and when the final stockades surrounded him, he plunged right through it and out. And as he was capable of giant joy, so did he harbor huge sorrow, so that when his dog died, the world ended. Tom was as an inventive as his father, but he was bolder. He would try things his father would not dare. Also, he had a large conscience to put the spurs in his flanks, and this Samuel did not have. Perhaps it was his driving sexual need that made him remain a bachelor. It was a very moral family he was born into. It might be that his dreams and his longing and his outlets, for that matter, made him feel unworthy, drove him sometimes whining into the hills. Tom was a nice mixture of savagery and gentleness. He worked inhumanely, only to those only to lose in effort his crushing impulses. The Irish do have a despairing quality of gaiety, but they also have a dour and brooding ghost that rides on their shoulders and peers in on their thoughts. Let them laugh too loudly, it sticks a long finger down their throats. They condemn themselves before they are charged, and this makes them defensive always. When Tom was nine years old, he worried because his pretty little sister Molly had an impediment in her speech. He asked her to open her mouth wide and saw that a membrane under her tongue caused the trouble. I can fix that, he said. He led her to a secret place far from the house, wetted his pocket knife on a stone, and cut the offending halter of speech. And then he ran away and was sick. The Hamilton house grew as the family grew. It was, it was designed to be unfinished so that the lean-tos could jut out as they were needed. The original room and kitchen soon disappeared in a welter of these lean-tos. Meanwhile, Samuel got no richer. He developed a very bad patent habit, a disease many men suffer from. He invented a part of a threshing machine, better, cheaper, and more efficient than any in existence. The patent attorney ate up his little profit for the year. Samuel sent his models to a manufacturer, who promptly rejected the plans and used the method. The next few years were kept lean by the suing, and the drain stopped only when he lost the suit. It was his first sharp experience with the rule that without money, you cannot fight money. But he had caught that patent fever, and year after year, the money made by threshing and by smithing was drained off in patents. The Hamilton children went barefoot, and their overalls were patched, and food was sometimes scarce to pay for the crisp blueprints with cogs and planes and elevations. Some men think big, and some think little. Samuel and his sons, Tom and Joe, thought big, and George and Will thought little. Joseph was the fourth son, a kind of mooning boy, greatly beloved and protected by the whole family. He early discovered that a smiling helplessness was his best protection from work. His brothers were tough, hard workers, all of them. It was easier to do Joe's work than to make him do it. His mother and father thought him a poet because he wasn't any good at anything else, and they so impressed him with this that he wrote glib verses to prove it. Joe was physically lazy and probably mentally lazy too. He daydreamed about his life, and his mother loved him more than the others because she thought he was helpless. Actually, he was the least helpless because he got exactly what he wanted with a minimum of effort. Joe was the darling of the family. In feudal times, an ineptness with sword and spear headed a young man for the church. In the Hamilton family, Joe's inability properly to function at Farm and Forge headed him for a higher education. He was not sickly or weak, but he did not lift very well. He rode horses badly and detested them. The whole family laughed with affection when they thought of Joe trying to learn to plow. His torturous first furrow wound about like a flattened stream, and his second furrow touched his first only once and then to cross it and wander off. Gradually, he eliminated himself from every farm duty. His mother explained that his mind was in the clouds, as though this was some singular virtue. When Joe had failed at every job, his father in despair put him to herding sixty sheep. This was the least difficult job of all of the one classically requiring no skill. All he had to do was to stay with the sheep, and Joe lost them, 
lost 60 sheep and couldn't find them where they huddled in the shade in a dry gulch. According to the family story, Samuel called the family together, girls and boys, and made them promise to take care of Joel after he was gone, for if they did not, Joe would surely starve. Interspersed with the Hamilton boys were five girls. Una was the oldest, a thoughtful, studious, dark girl. Lizzie, I guess Lizzie must have been the oldest since she was named for her mother. I don't know much about Lizzie. She, er she early seemed to find a shame for her family. She married young and went away and thereafter was seen only at funerals. Lizzie had a capacity for hatred and bitterness unique among the Hamiltons. She had a son, and when he grew up and married a girl Lizzie didn't like, she did not speak to him for many years. Then there was Dessie, whose laughter was so constant that everyone near her was glad to be there because it was more fun to be with Dessie than with anyone else. The next sister was Olive, my mother, and last was Molly, who was a little beauty with lovely blonde hair and violet eyes. These were the Hamiltons, and it was almost a miracle how Liza, skinny little bitty that she was, produced them year after year and fed them, baked bread, made their clothes, and clothed them with a good manners and iron morals too. It is amazing how Liza stamped her children. She was completely without experience in the world. She was on red and, except for the one long trip from Ireland, untraveled. She had no experience with men save only her husband, and that she looked upon as a tiresome and sometimes painful duty. A good part of her life was taken up with bearing and raising. Her total intellectual association was the Bible, except the talk of Samuel and her children, and to them she did not listen. In that one book she had her history and her poetry, her knowledge of peoples and things, her ethics, her morals, and her salvation. She never studied the Bible or inspected it, she just read it. The many places where it seems to refute itself did not confuse her in the least. And finally, she came to a point where she knew it so well that she went right on reading it without listening. Liza enjoyed universal respect because she was a good woman and raised good children. She could hold up her head anywhere. Her husband and her children and her grandchildren respected her. There was a nail-hard strength in her, a lack of any compromise, a rightness in the face of all opposing wrongness, which made you hold her in a kind of awe, but not in warmth. Liza hated alcoholic liquors and in, with an iron zeal. Drinking alcohol in any form she regarded as a crime against a properly outraged deity. Not only would she not touch it herself, but she resisted its enjoyment by anyone else. The result, naturally, was that her husband, Samuel, and all her children had a good, lusty love for a drink. Once when he was very ill, Samuel asked, Liza, couldn't I have a glass of whiskey to ease me? She set her little hard chin. Would you go to the throne of God with liquor on your breath? You would not, she said. Samuel rolled over on his side and went about his illness without ease. When Liza was about 70, her elimination slowed up, and her doctor told her to take a tablespoon of port wine for medicine. She forced down the first spoonful, making a crooked face, but it was not so bad. And from that moment, she never drew a completely sober breath. She always took the wine in a tablespoon. It was always medicine, but after a time she was go doing over a quart a day, and she was a much more relaxed and happy woman. Samuel and Liza Hamilton got all their children raised and well toward adulthood before the turn of the century. It was a whole clot of Hamiltons growing up on the ranch to the east of King City, and they were American children and young men and women. Samuel never went back to Ireland, and gradually he forgot it entirely. He was a busy man. He had no time for nostalgia. The Salinas Valley was the world. A trip to Salinas 60 miles to the north at the head of the valley was event enough for a year, and the incessant work on the ranch, the care and feeding and clothing of his bountiful family took most of his time, but not all. His energy was large. His daughter Una had become a brooding student, tense and dark. He was proud of her wild, exploring mind. Olive was preparing to take county examinations after a stretch in the secondary school in Salinas. Olive was going to be a teacher, an honor like having a priest in the family in Ireland. Joe was to be sent to college because he was no damn good at anything else. Will was well along the way to accidental fortune. Tom bruised himself on the world and licked his cuts. Desi was studying dressmaking. And Molly, 
pretty Molly, would obviously marry some well-to-do man. There was no question of inheritance. Although the Hill Ranch was large, it was abysmally poor. Samuel sunk well after well and could not find water on his own land. That would have made the difference. Water would have made them comparatively rich. The one poor pipe of water pumped up from deep near the house was the only source. Sometimes it got dangerously low, and twice it went dry. The cattle had to come from the far fringe of the ranch to drink, and then go out again to feed. All in all, it was a good, firm, grounded family, permanent, and successfully planted in the Salinas Valley, not poorer than many, and not richer than many either. It was a well-balanced family with its conservatives and its radicals, its dreamers and its realists. Samuel was well pleased with the fruit of his loins. Chapter 6 After Adam joined the army and Cyrus moved to Washington, Charles lived alone on the farm. He boasted about getting himself a wife, but he did not go about doing it by the usual process of meeting girls, taking them to dances, testing their virtues or otherwise, and finally slipping feebly into marriage. The truth of it was that Charles was abysmally timid of girls, and, like most shy men, he satisfied his normal needs in the anonymity of the prostitute. There is great safety for a shy man with a whore. Having been paid for and in advance, she has become a commodity, and a shy man can be gay with her and even brutal to her. Also, there is none of the horror of the possible turndown which shrivels the guts of timid men. The arrangement was simple and reasonably secret. The owner of the inn kept three rooms on his top floor for transients, which he rented to girls for two-week periods. At the end of two weeks, a new set of girls took their place. Mr. Hallam, the innkeeper, had no part in the arrangement. He could almost say with truth that he didn't know anything about it. He simply collected five times the normal rent for his three rooms. The girls were assigned, procured, moved, disciplined, and robbed by a whoremaster named Edwards, who lived in Boston. His girls moved in a slow circuit among the small towns, never staying anywhere more than two weeks. It was an extremely workable system. A girl was not in town long enough to cause remark either by citizen or town marshal. They stayed pretty much in the rooms and avoided public places. They were forbidden on pain of beating to drink or make noise or to fall in love with anyone. Meals were served in their rooms and the clients were carefully screened. No drunken man was permitted to go up to them. Every six months, each girl was given one month of vacation to get drunk and raise hell. On the job, let a girl be disobedient with the rules and Mr. Edwards personally stripped her, gagged her, and horsewhipped her within an inch of her life. If she did it again, she found herself in jail, charged with vagrancy and public prostitution. The two-week stands had another advantage. Many of the girls were diseased, and a girl had nearly always gone away by the time her gift had incubated in a client. There was no one, man, no one for a man to get mad at. Mr. Hallam knew nothing about it, and Mr. Edwards never appeared publicly in his business capacity. He had a very good thing in his circuit. The girls were all pretty much alike. Big, healthy, lazy, and dull. A man could hardly tell there had been a change. Charles Trask made it a habit to go to the inn at, le at least once every two weeks to creep up to the top floor, do his quick business, and return to the bar to get mildly drunk. The Trask house had never been gay, but lived in only by Charles, it took on a gloomy, rustling decay. The lace curtains were gray. The floors, although swept, grew sticky and dank. The kitchen was lacquered, walls, windows, and ceiling, with grease from the frying pans. The constant scrubbing by the wives who had lived there in the biannual deep-seated scourging had kept the dirt down. Charles rarely did more than sweep. He gave up sheets on his bed and slept between blankets. What good to clean the house when there was no one to see it? Only on the nights he went to the inn did he wash himself and put on clean clothes. Charles developed a restlessness that got him out at dawn. He worked the farm mightily because he was lonely. Coming in from his work, he gorged himself on fried food and went to bed and to sleep in the, re in the resulting torpor. His dark face took on the serious expressionlessness of a man who is nearly always alone. He missed his brother more than he missed his mother and father. He remembered quite inaccurately the time before Adam went away as the happy time, and he wanted it to come again. 
During the years, he was never sick, except, of course, for the chronic indigestion, which was universal, and still is with men who live alone, cook for themselves, and eat in solitude. For this, he took a powerful purge called Father George's Elixir of Life. One accident he did have in the third year of his aloneness. He was digging out rocks and sledding them to the stone wall. One large boulder was difficult to move. Charles pried at it with a long iron bar, and the rock bucked and rolled back again and again. Suddenly, he lost his temper. The little smile came on his face, and he fought the stone as though it were a man in silent fury. He drove his bar deep behind it and threw his whole weight back. The bar slipped, and its upper end crashed against his forehead. For a few moments, he lay unconscious in the field, and then he rolled over and staggered, half-blinded to the house. There was a long, torn welt on his forehead from hairline to a point between his eyebrows. For a few weeks, his head was bandaged over a draining infection, but that did not worry him. And that day, pus was thought to be benign, a proof that a wound was healing properly. When the wound did heal, it left a long and crinkled scar, and while most scar tissue is lighter than the surrounding skin, Charles's scar turned dark brown. Perhaps the bar had forced iron rust under the skin and made a kind of tattoo. The wound had not worried Charles, but the scar did. It looked like a long finger mark laid on his forehead. He inspected it often in the little mirror by the stove. He combed his hair down over his forehead to conceal as much as, of it as he could. He conceived a shame for his scar. He hated his scar. He became restless when anyone looked at it, and fury rose in him if any question was asked about it. In a letter to his brother, he put down his feeling about it. It looks, he wrote, like somebody marked me like a cow. The damn thing gets darker. By the time you get home, it will maybe be black. All I need is one going the other way, and I would look like a papist on Ash Wednesday. I don't know why it bothers me. I got plenty other scars. It just seems like I was marked. And when I go into town, like to the inn, why, people are always looking at it. I can hear them talking about it when they don't know I can hear. I don't know why they're so damn curious about it. It gets so I don't feel like going in town at all. Adam was discharged in 1885 and started to beat his way home. In appearance, he had changed little. There was no military carriage about him. The cavalry didn't act that way. Indeed, some units took pride in a sloppy posture. Adam felt that he was sleepwalking. It is a hard thing to leave any deeply routine life, even if you hate it. In the morning, he awakened on a split second and lay waiting for reveal. His calves missed the hung of the leggings and his throat felt naked without its tight collar. He arrived in Chicago and there, for no reason, rented a furnished room for a week, stayed in it for two days, went to Buffalo, changed his mind, and moved to Niagara Falls. He didn't want to go home and he put it off as long as possible. Home was not a pleasant place in his mind. The kind of feelings he had, he had had there were dead in him and he had a reluctance to bring them to life. He watched the falls by the hour, their roar stupefied and hypnotized him. One evening, he felt a crippling loneliness for the close men in barracks and tent. His impulse was to rush into a crowd for warmth, any crowd. The first crowded public place he could find was a little bar, thronged and smoky. He sighed with pleasure, almost nestled in the human clot the way a cat nestles into a woodpile. He ordered whiskey and drank it and felt warm and good. He did not see or hear. He simply absorbed the contact. As it grew late and the men began to drift away, he became fearful of the time when he could have to go home. Soon he was alone with the bartender who was rubbing and rubbing the mahogany of the bar and trying with his eyes and his manner to get Adam to go. I'll have one more, Adam said. The bartender set the bottle out. Adam noticed him for the first time. He had a strawberry mark on his forehead. I'm a stranger in these parts, said Adam. That's what we mostly get at the falls, the bartender said. I've been in the army, cavalry. Yeah, said the bartender. Adam felt suddenly that he had, had to impress this man, had to get under his skin some way. Fighting Indians, he said. Had some great times. The man did not answer him. My brother has a mark on his head. The bartender touched the strawberry mark with his fingers. Birthmark, he said. Gets bigger every year. 
Your brother got one? His came from a cut. He wrote me about it. You notice this one of mine looks like a cat? Sure it does. That's my nickname, Cat. Had it all my life. They say my old lady must have been scared by a cat when she was having me. I'm on my way home. Been away a long time. Won't you have a drink? Thanks. Where are you staying? Mrs. May's boarding house. I know her. What, the, what they tell is she fills you up with soup so you can't eat much. I guess there are tricks to every trade, said Adam. I guess that's right. There's sure plenty in mine. I bet that's true, said Adam. But the one trick I need I haven't got. I wish I knew that one. What is it? How the hell to get you to go home and let me to close up? Adam stared at him. Stared at him and did not speak. It, it's a joke, the bartender said uneasily. I guess I'll go home in the morning, said Adam. I mean my real home. Good luck, the bartender said. Adam walked through the dark town, increasing his speed as though his loneliness sniffed along behind him. The sagging front steps of his boarding house creaked a warning as he climbed them. The hall was gloomed with a dot of yellow light from an oil lamp turned down so low that it jerked expiringly. The landlady stood in her open doorway and her nose made a shadow to the bottom of her chin. Her cold eyes followed Adam as do the eyes of a front-painted portrait, and she listened with her nose for the whiskey that was in him. Good night, said Adam. She did not answer him. At the top of the first flight, he looked back. Her head was raised, and now her chin made a shadow on her throat, and her eyes had no pupils. His room smelled of dust dampened and dried many times. He picked a match from his block and scratched it on the side of the block. He lighted the shank of a candle in the japanned candlestick and regarded the bed, as spineless as a hammock and covered with a dirty patchwork quilt, the cotton batting spilling from the edges. The porch steps complained again, and Adam knew the woman would be standing in her doorway, ready to spray inhospitality on the new arrival. Adam sat down in a straight chair and put his elbows on his knees and supported his chin in his hands. A rumor down the hall began a patient continuing cough against the quiet night, and Adam knew he could not go home. He had heard old soldiers tell of doing what he was going to do. I just couldn't stand it. Didn't have no place to go. Didn't know nobody. Wandered around and pretty soon I got in a panic like a kid, and first thing I know it, I'm begging the sergeant to let me back in, like he was doing me a favor. Back in Chicago, Adam re-enlisted and asked to be assigned to his old regiment. On the train going west, the men of his squadron seemed very dear and desirable. While he waited to change trains in Kansas City, he heard his name called and a message was shoved into his hand. Orders to report to Washington to the office of the Secretary of War. Adam, in his five years, had, had absorbed rather than learned never to wonder about an order. To an enlisted man, the high far gods in Washington were crazy. And if a soldier wanted to keep his sanity, he thought about generals as little as possible. In due course, Adam gave his name to a clerk and went to sit in an anteroom. His father found him there. It took Adam a moment to recognize Cyrus and much longer to get used to him. Cyrus had become a great man. He dressed like a great man. Black broadcloth coat and trousers, wide black hat, overcoat with a velvet collar, ebony cane which he made seem he made to seem a sword and cyrus conducted himself like a great man his speech was slow and mellow measured and unexcited his gestures were wide and new teeth gave him a vulpine smile out of all proportion to his emotion after adam had realized that this was his father he was still puzzled suddenly he looked down no wooden leg the leg was straight bent at the knee and the foot was clad in a polished kid congress gaiter. When he moved, there was a limp, but not a clumping wooden-legged limp. Cyrus saw the look. Mechanical, he said. Works on a hinge. Got a spring. Don't even limp when I set my mind to it. I'll show it to you when I take it off. Come along with me. Adam said, I'm under orders, sir. I'm to report to Colonel Wells. I know you are. I told Wells to issue the orders. Come along, Adam said uneasily. If you don't mind, sir, I think I'd better report to Colonel Wells. His father reversed himself. 
I was testing you, he said grandly. I wanted to see whether the army has had any discipline these days. Good boy. I knew it would be good for you. You're a man and a soldier, my boy. I'm under orders, sir, said Adam. This man was a stranger to him. A faint distaste arose in Adam. Something was not true. In the speed with which doors opened straight to the colonel, the obsequious respect of that officer, the words, The secretary will see you now, sir, did not remove Adam's feeling. This is my son, a private soldier, Mr. Secretary, just as I was a private soldier in the United States Army. I was a discharged a, cor a corporal, sir, said Adam. He hardly heard the exchange of compliments. He was thinking, this is the Secretary of War. Can't he see that this isn't the way my father is? He's play acting. What's happened to him? It's funny the Secretary can't see it. They walked to the small hotel where Cyrus lived, and on the way Cyrus pointed out the sites, the buildings, the spots of history, with the expansiveness of a lecturer. I live in a hotel, he said. I've thought of getting a house, but I'm on the move so much it wouldn't hardly pay. I'm all over the country most of the time. The hotel clerk couldn't see it either. He bowed to Cyrus, called him senator, and indicated that he would give Adam a room if he had to throw someone out. Send a bottle of whiskey to my room, please. I can send some chipped ice if you like. Ice, said Cyrus. My son is a soldier. He wrapped his leg with his stick and gave forth a hollow sound. I have been a soldier, a private soldier. What do we want ice for? Adam was amazed at Cyrus's accommodations. He had not only a bedroom, but a sitting room beside it, and the toilet was in a closet right in the bedroom. Cyrus sat down in a deep chair and sighed. He pulled up his trouser leg, and Adam saw the contraption of iron and leather and hard wood. Cyrus unlaced the leather sheath that held it on his stump and stood the travesty on flesh beside his chair. It gets the pension pretty bad, he said. With the leg off, his father became himself again, the self Adam remembered. He had experienced the beginning of contempt, but now the childhood fear and respect and animosity came back to him, so that he seemed a little boy testing his father's immediate mood to escape trouble. Cyrus made his reparations, drank his whiskey, and loosened his collar. He faced Adam. Well, sir, why did you re-enlist? I, I don't know, sir. I just wanted to. You don't like the army, Adam. No, sir. Why did you go back? I didn't want to go home. Cyrus sighed and rubbed the tips of his fingers on the arms of his chair. Are you going to stay in the army? He asked. I don't know, sir. I can get you into West Point. I have influence. I can get you discharged so you can enter West Point. I don't want to go there. Are you defying me? Cyrus asked quietly. Adam took a long time to answer, and his mind sought escape before he said, Yes, sir. Cyrus said, Pour me some whiskey, son. And when he had it, he continued, I wonder if you know how much influence I really have. I can throw the Grand Army at any candidate like a sock. Even the President likes to know what I think about public matters. I can get senators defeated, and I can pick appointments like apples. I can make men, and I can destroy men. Do you know that? Adam knew more than that. He knew that Cyrus was defending himself with threats. Yes, sir, I've heard. I could get you assigned to Washington. Assigned to me, even. Teach you your way about. I'd rather go back to my regiment, sir. He saw the shadow of loss darken his father's face. Maybe I made a mistake. You've learned the dumb resistance of a soldier. He sighed. I'll get you ordered to your regiment. You'll rot in the barracks. Thank you, sir. After a pause, Adam asked. Why don't you bring Charles here? Because I... No, Charles is better where he is. Better where he is. Adam remembered his father's tone and how he looked, and he had plenty of time to remember because he did rot in barracks. He remembered that Cyrus was lonely and alone and knew it. Charles had looked forward to Adam's return after five years. He had painted the house and the barn, and as the time approached, he had a woman in to clean the house, to clean it to the bone. 
She was a clean, mean old woman. She looked at the dust-gray riding curtains, threw them out, and made new ones. She dug grease out of the stove that had been there since Charles's mother died, and she leached the walls of a brown, shiny nastiness deposited by cooking fat and kerosene lamps. She pickled the floors with lye, soaked the blankets in sal soda, complaining the whole time to herself. Men, dirty animals, pigs is clean compared, rotten their own juice, don't see how no woman ever marries them, stink like measles, look at oven, pie juice from Methuselah. Charles had moved into a shed where his nostrils would not be assailed by the immaculate but painful smells of lye and soda and ammonia and yellow soap. He did, however, get the impression that she didn't approve of his housekeeping. When finally she grumbled away from the shining house, Charles remained in the shed. He wanted to keep the house clean for Adam. In the shed where he slept were the tools of the farm and the tools for their repair and maintenance. Charles found that he could cook his fried and boiled meals more quickly and efficiently on the forge than he could on the kitchen stove. The bellows forced quick flaring heat from the coke. A man didn't have to wait for a stove to heat up. He wondered why he had never thought of it before. Charles waited for Adam, and Adam did not come. Perhaps Adam was the shame to write. It was Cyrus who told Charles in an angry letter about Adam's reenlistment against his wishes. And Cyrus indicated that, in some future, Charles could visit him in Washington, but he never asked him again. Charles moved back to the house and lived in a kind of savage filth, taking a satisfaction in overcoming the work of the grumbling woman. It was over a year before Adam wrote to Charles, a letter of embarrassed newsiness building his courage to say, I don't know why I signed again. It was like somebody else doing it. Write soon and tell me how you are. Charles did not reply until he had received four anxious letters, and then he replied coolly, I didn't hardly expect you anyway. And he went on with a detailed account of farm and animals. Time had got in its work. After that, Charles wrote right after New Year's and received a letter from Adam written right after New Year's. They had grown so apart that there was little mutual reference and no questions. Charles began to keep one slovenly woman after another. When they got on his nerves, he threw them out the way he would sell a pig. He didn't like them and had no interest in whether or not they liked him. He grew away from the village. His contacts were only with the inn and the postmaster. The village people might denounce his manner of life, but one thing he had which balanced his ugly life even in their eyes. The farm had never been so well run. Charles cleared land, built up his walls, improved his drainage, and added a hundred acres to the farm. More than that, he was planting tobacco, and a long new tobacco barn stood impressively behind the house. For these things, he kept the respect of his neighbors. A farmer cannot think too much evil of a good farmer. Charles was spending most of his money and all of his energy on the farm. Thanks for joining me for tonight's edition of Booked for the Night. I'll be back tomorrow night with more of East of Eden by John Steinbeck. Until then, thanks for listening and good night.